The title, unfortunately, is not clickbait. This is, for several reasons, the worst guitar I've ever played and ever showed on this channel, but at the same time, it also has many features that I think every headless company can learn from. This is probably the last Amazon instrument I'll ever buy, so let's get right to discussing the Groat headless guitar. And at this point, we're pretty far from the premise of the Stramberg experiment, but I promise this will all make sense once we get to the season finale coming soon. Now, unlike my normal reviews where I start from the headstock and work my way down, today I'm going to approach this guitar, the review, the same way I approach getting any new guitar, and along the way I'll show you how I discovered this guitar's greatness and lack the rough. So, whenever I first pick up a guitar, be it an acoustic or an electric, all I do is tune it up and put it on my lap and start playing. And even if it's an electric, I don't amplify it at this point because the point I'm trying to do right now is just to see how the guitar feels against my body and my hands, the layout, and so on. And you may find this unfair, but if I'm at a music shop, for example, and the guitar doesn't pass this first phase, I rarely even continue forward with it. Now, the Grote headless guitar passed this first test with flying colors, and I was actually very excited because it immediately gave me some new ideas about guitar design. Tuning was a bit difficult, but I assumed this was because it was shipped with heavier strings, and there was still so much going for this instrument in my first phase, phase one of testing. Now, you'll have to take this next part with a grain of salt because a lot of the specs on these instruments are either incorrect or inconsistent. But the neck is listed as Canadian maple, I'm not sure what the second wood is in the neck. And interestingly enough, there doesn't appear to be a finish on the back of the neck. Now, I'm not a luthier or a woodworker, so I honestly don't know if not having any type of finish is a major drawback in terms of its long-term stability. But I will say, it does feel really interesting. It's sanded really well, and it's very comfortable. On this channel, I sometimes complain that a lot of these standard modern guitars have a typical medium C-shaped neck. And this guitar does also have a medium C neck, but it does have a lot more shoulder than a lot of guitars I've been playing lately. And I'm finding this neck really, really comfortable. The fretboard is some type of high pressure laminate. And I have to say, I like this feature a lot too. In fact, one of my favorite features about Parker guitars and some VJ guitars is that they have a very smooth fretboard. If you've never played a composite fretboard of any type, it's hard to describe, but when you combine that with stainless steel frets, which this guitar also has, it feels like you're almost bending on glass and it's such a cool feeling. It's kind of like having a red sports car. Even when you're playing slow dad blues licks, it just feels fast. The fret ends are also done very well. We have that ball and rounding and they're completely smooth from the top all the way to the bottom on both sides. Now, when you look closely at the inlays, it's clear that this is a cheap guitar, and you can even feel all of the gaps between the high pressure laminate and the inlay itself. So that's not great overall, but the rest of the neck actually feels really, really nice and also, for once, unique. Now, before I continue, I wanna state that I, of course, have no idea how well these materials would hold up long term. All stainless steel is not made equal, and all high pressure laminates are not made equal, and I'd never say that this instrument is anywhere near the quality of a VGA or a Prime Parker, but remember, we're talking about phase one and how I felt about this guitar when I first picked it up. And as we continue down to this body, I'll tell you that I bought this guitar specifically for this shape. I've been raving about the ergonomics of playing headless guitars throughout this experiment and having guitars at this 45 degree angle, roughly, more or less is also fine, but, you need either a specific device or a special guitar to achieve that position without a strap. The one drawback of guitars that were specifically designed with this position in mind is potentially how much body real estate they dedicate to the leg rest contour. As you can see on the Strandberg, it does fit on my lap very nicely, but it would be nice if this area were a little bit bigger because some of these corners on any guitar with this type of design can poke into your leg depending on how you're shaped and how you sit and all of that stuff. And while the Strandberg is very comfortable, the earth is quite uncomfortable because of how sharp the corners are and because of how heavy the body is. So this position isn't as great. With the Grote guitar, you can see that this entire bottom area is completely dedicated to resting on your leg. So there is so much surface area to come in contact with your thigh that there is no way that this area can be uncomfortable. And again, this design feature is what caught my eye about this instrument. So in phase one with this guitar, 
resting comfortably on my lap, feeling very shockingly comfortable with the neck, I was surprised and really, really impressed at how well things were going, especially considering this instrument's price. As we move on to phase two, I still don't plug in the guitar, because first I want to take a quick look around the instrument, check out the finish, the control layout, put on my own strings, set it up, and so on. And shockingly enough, this guitar passed almost all of those tests as well, let me explain. So the control layout is simple, it makes sense, and the volume and tone knob are actually not in the way, the three-way switch is easy to get to, I'm happy with the control layout. The tolerances on the neck pocket aren't the best, but again, I don't see why this will be an issue with this bolt-on design. And there's actually a surprising amount of carving on the lower horn, which makes high fret access really, really good. Even though the body is listed as mahogany, this guitar is very light, which tells me that this probably isn't mahogany, but that doesn't bother me personally. I do hate the top. I think it's very ugly, but again, who cares when it's a guitar at this price? I don't really care about how it looks. And so as you can see, Phase two is starting off very, very encouraging. And now it's time to go to the restringing process and look at the hardware. And in the Strandberg experiment, we've been spending a lot of time talking about the bridge and the string lock hardware because we have basically slowly learned that when it comes to headless guitars, hardware is a huge, huge deal. Replacing a pair of standard tuners and even a bridge and tailpiece is fairly inexpensive on a standard guitar, and it's also very easy. Changing out headless hardware can be a huge expense and a really annoying process since every guitar is routed for a specific set of hardware that may or may not have retrofittable parts and aftermarket alternatives. So here's all of the good. I absolutely love that this guitar is strung with the ball ends coming from the head. It eliminates so many potential issues that can be found on other headless guitars. It's fast, it's simple, it works. It's a huge positive. I don't know why other high-end companies don't design their headless this way. When I first saw the bridge, I was a little bit concerned, but once I took a moment to actually try a string change, I realized that it's actually very workable and it has several positive points that are not found on a lot of other high-end headless guitars. Here's one great point. These tuners can turn infinitely like standard tuners, which isn't the case on Strandberg's or many other typical headless hardware. That means when you start restringing the instrument, it doesn't matter where you start restringing from, you'll never run out of turnability with these tuners. And just to put things in perspective, I only know of one other headless bridge that has this feature, and that's the Sophia bridge, which is one of the most high-end bridges you can get. Again, there might be other bridges that have that feature, but I haven't seen them on some of the major headless brands. And the restringing process is actually fairly easy. You start by dropping the ball end in the headstock, then you pull the string down to the bridge, and I like to cut it right at the end of the bridge. This will ensure you have more than enough slack to string through the bridge itself, and really you can cut it even a bit more without any issue. Next, I like to give the string a little bit of a bend so it slots in easier. Next, you can either turn the tuner with your hand, or you can use this magnetic tool that makes it a little bit faster as part of the bridge, or you can use my Allen wrench with a drill solution for the fastest method possible, and it really is that simple. The string didn't slip one time or anything out of the ordinary, so I strung up all six strings very quickly. And setting the intonation was also super easy. It's just one little screw and then it moves freely and you can lock it back down. Again, I was very impressed up until this point. So now you're probably thinking to yourself, I better run out and get one of these girl guitars on Amazon, but this is actually right when things started spiraling downward very rapidly. Here's the first thing. I use my own tool, as you saw, to speed up the tuning process. But once I got close to being in tune and I want to refine the tuning with my hands, I realized that it's very, very difficult to maneuver these tuners with your hands. Even with an eight to 38 set, like you know I always use, there's just way too much tension to tune accurately. And I personally don't like using this tiny magnetic tool because as you know, I'm prone to dropping things. And once they drop on this floor, I never find them again. So since you can't tune with your fingers very accurately because of the tension, and since I don't like using this tool, although you could use it, 
I just feel like tuning this guitar is going to be a pain. I mean, can you just imagine if you were performing live and your string went a little bit out of tune, so you try to grab this little magnetic tool out of the slot, and then you try to maneuver it on top of the peg and adjust, and then put it back in the magnetic. I mean, come on. No one's gonna be able to do that. And I'm going to admit that this next big issue may just be because I'm a stupid, stupid man. But I could not figure out any way whatsoever to adjust the string height on this bridge. There are several screws and oddly enough, they all have a different size wrench to use with them, which is kind of annoying, but I had all the wrenches anyway, so whatever. I try turning every single screw and nothing is adjusting the string height. Some of these screws don't appear to be doing anything at all. Maybe they just hold the thing together, but point being, I cannot figure out how to adjust the string height. I try going on their website. I try going on forums. I can't find anyone to explain how to adjust the string height on this bridge. And that means that this bridge simply has to go and God knows what bridge you can get to replace it that's going to fit in the right way. This is again why headless hardware is so important when you're buying a headless guitar. Also, the way that these tuners stick up is absolutely terrible for anyone who wants to do palm muting. So, okay, the string height is incorrect, but how does it sound? Well, amplified sound takes us to phase three of my testing because usually if everything else is good on the instrument, I don't mind just changing out the pickups and adjusting my EQ so that the guitar sounds more like me. So I go to plug in the guitar and, well, And now I see the design is not as genius as I thought it might actually be. Believe it or not, I didn't even realize that this would be an issue or that this was going to be a major flaw in terms of the input jack location and ergonomics. I've never found a jack location to be an issue on any other headless guitar. And even back when I tried an Aristides guitar and I was a headless model, they specifically designed the instrument to have two input jacks to avoid having this exact issue. And I guess it was quite dumb of me to think that an inexpensive guitar from Amazon would have the same forethought of a very high-end instrument from Aristides. But this is an issue. And yes, I guess you can drill a new hole and change the location of the input jack, but this is just no good. Finally, we get to the actual pickups and these might be the worst humbucker pickups I've ever tried on any instrument ever. I'm going to do something very different to show you how much they lack output and lack clarity. I'm going to play the Stramberg guitar that has amazing short pickups. Then I'm going to play the Earth guitar, which has bad pickups, but at least normal output. And then I'm going to plug in this guitar. I'm not going to change any settings. I want you just to hear the amount of volume drop off we get with these very cheap pickups. The output is simply unusable. You may know that whenever I try a guitar in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking of certain features that I could put on my dream guitar build one day. Things like this really nice back of the guitar, perhaps even a headless design where the strings go in this way. These are things that pique my interest about this instrument. These are things that I'm impressed by with this guitar. That being said, there's no way I could recommend that you go out and buy this instrument for the reasons I discussed in this video. Now we're coming close to the end of this series, but there are still a couple of things we need to revisit when it comes to our original instrument, of course, that being the Strandberg. So we'll do that in the next episodes of the Strandberg Experiment.